put anything together. We thought, let's try to raise some funds for our field. Our field's named after Stubby Overmeyer, which, so John, Stubby, you probably yeah. knew Stubby, right? Well, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I get a phone call and says, well, when is this event? And I said, well, we don't know yet. He goes, well, I want to know. And I go, who's this? He goes, it's Denny McClain. I thought, yeah, one of my buddies is playing a joke <laughs> on me. Denny, this is no Denny McClain. He goes, well, when you get a date, give me a call. So we finally get a date. I call him up. I go, are you still coming? He goes, I told you I'm coming. And that's how I met Denny McClain. Um, the one person that's not here tonight that we sometimes kind of neglect is um, Sharon was just as big force behind this as Denny. Um, I remember the first event we had, Sharon sent me a email that night saying, hey, next year we're going to do double. We're going to do better. She was such a force behind it. And um, when this comes out, I just hope Sharon realizes how much we love her and miss her because she was awesome. With that said, Mike's going to, we're going to give it to the pro here and let Mike take over. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah, give it, hey, give us a little bit. Let's go. What are we, chop liver? <laughs> huh? Well, Mike's going to MC it. Oh. But, but we're professionals. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that, too. You got two of the best the here. The pros. Okay, the pros. I'll, I'll stay out of your way, I promise. <laughs> stay out of the way, man. <laughs> All right, what we're going to do is I'm just going to kind of come around. Yeah. If anybody has got any questions that you can want to ask, John or Denny, just raise your hand. I'll come on around, and uh, we'll just kind of do a short, quick question and answer type of deal. Yeah, right, short. But that, yeah. micro <laughs> but, but that microphone doesn't work. Well, you're going to have to have your uh, good hearing going tonight so you can hear people. <laughs> I'll relay it to you. All right. <laughs> All right, who's got a question? You still play oh. the organ? You mean this? Yeah. Yeah. I thought the other one. <laughs> hey. Way too much <laughs> All right. Here's one right up front. It should uh, be. Able listen. To the only thing that doesn't function on my body is my right arm. <laughs> That's good. Uh, to my, know. my three favorite players: McLean, uh, Warden, and McCullough. You got any yeah. stories about Dick McCullough? Oh God! Let me give you a dollar. You're one of my favorite. Said I was one of his three favorites. You had to pay him, huh, John? Yeah. He named you? Yeah. He me. named Dick. Did you, me, you, me, and McAuliffe. Well, Dickie was, uh, for the lack of a better term, intense. Um, the only guy that, that was more intense than Dickie was Jimmy Northup, the guy in this picture back here. Northup, before I tell you about Dick, uh, is that, uh, and I used to call him Little Dick. <laughs> for a number of reasons. <laughs> and uh, uh, Northrop used to take a bat, and he was a left-handed hitter, as probably most of you know, and he would take a, a, a bat back to the hotel. Just on her, we don't know what he did when he was home, but when he was on the road, he would take a bat back to the hotel, put four, five, six pillows into a chair, and work on his swing for about an hour and a half, every night on the road. You wanted to kill the by the, by the time this hour, <laughs> he was absolutely so atomically ready to hurt somebody that every night, if he didn't go four for four, and he didn't very often, uh, but he was the player and a half. He was, he was a monster player for us in the World Series in the seventh game. You may remember he's the guy that uh, hit the ball to the fence. Everybody thinks... He, uh, flood misjudged it. He didn't flood it. The ball bounced one hop into the center field wall. Does that sound like he misjudged the ball? I mean, uh, now they got all these stats that they come out with. Well, the the pitch was 96 miles an hour. Yeah. And it left the bat at 116. The angle, what? the flying angle was. Uh, oh yeah. my God! I, I just uh, they they make you sick now with with the information because first of all, none of us know if it's right. And secondly, who cares? Yeah. You know, a home run's a home run. That analytical stuff is <laughs> The players hate it. Uh, it's terrible. I, I'll tell you one about McAuliffe. Uh, and one thing, I, Lou Brock, I mean, uh, Flood. Flood, I've had Cardinal fans go, well, hey, you know, if uh, Flood hadn't fallen down out there, I said, whoa, stop right there. Yep. He didn't fall. His foot, you can see the turf move a little bit. Because he, he took a step in, and when he turned to go, he was he'd never got it anyway. No, he could have been on a dead run; he still wouldn't have got it. But one of the worst streaks we had all season is when McAuliffe got in the fight with Tommy John. Oh yeah, 
They suspended him. The league suspended him for four games. We went to New York, play a four-game series against the Yankees. We lost every game by one run. Did we really? Yeah. No kidding. And one of them, the uh, second night in, I think, it was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. And uh, it, the Friday night game went like 8, 10 innings. And back then they had a curfew. Oh, and they wouldn't right. start a game, so they they quit the game, and then the next day we picked it up, and Rocky Calavito pitched for the Yankees. He'd never pitched before, and they <laughs> he shut us out, and they got a run. Rocky's only only victory in his life is 1-0 in <laughs> lifetimes against us. But that's what – that's I always measured that as McAuliffe. I think he was an unsung MVP of that team, of our team. He, he had such enthusiasm, and I tell you, he'd fight a drop a hat. You look at him wrong. Oh, in a New York second. Oh man, I mean, he was ready. He was so geared up. He and, was, you know, they used to write a lot of stories about Ty Cobb. Not that I was there, by the way. But uh, you, well, you ruined with it at the end, didn't it? Don't go there. <laughs> and uh, uh, what happened was, um, the hell, who was I talking about? No, oh, Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb and McCullough and uh, McCullough was so intense, and, and actually the only two guys that were super, super intense in our club, I mean, a little bit out of control from time to time, were McCullough and Northup. Yeah. But McCullough, when he ran the bases, he literally was Ty Cobb. He would slide with his uh, spikes up, no matter what base he was sliding into, second, third, home, didn't make any difference. He, right would, he was not going to let you tag him in a gentleman manner. I mean, you had to get the <laughs> out of the way and hope that he didn't hurt you, because you know, when we played the game, um, not that the game is that different today, but there were certain things allowed that they don't allow today. I mean, it's like that bad call, and, and I don't know how many people agree, but there was a terrible call in the, in the World Series the other night. That guy was in the middle of the baseline, for God's sake. Yeah, he never gets I mean, how can you call him out? Um, that never happened when we played. Sure, we had guys called out if they swerved out of the baseline, but it had to be obvious. And why they even called it, why they even called time, that play is not appealable. Yeah, it's not And they wasted 15 minutes Fifth appealing ball. it. And the, and the greatest thing was Turner, on the one ball club, is standing at the top of the dugout yelling, don't you guys know the commissioner's right here? Ask him, for God's sake. <laughs> Ask him. He's right here. Don't well, you know that? He kept saying, Joe Torrey's right there. And Joe Torrey's right there. He's in charge of all this stuff. Ask Torrey. He saw it. Yeah. And Torrey sat there with his head down. He wouldn't even look up. That's right, he did. His, did. his, his head, head was just down like this for down. like 15 minutes. But it's it, it's just crazy the way they react to some of this stuff now. They make the rules, and then they don't want to stand behind most of them. It, it, it's crazy right now. You know, and we got these ding-dang pitch counts. I mean, if, if, if we were playing today oh and we had to live with pitch counts, he as a relief pitcher would only be allowed to throw 20 pitches. Now, how do you get and, – and the new rule that they're trying to put in next year is that the relief pitcher has to face three, three guys. guys. Yeah. Can you imagine? So now you bring a guy in, and the guy gives up, let's say, two home runs in a row. You don't think the manager wants to pull that guy out right away? <laughs> now he's got to pitch one more guy, and he hits one. Now you've let them hit three home runs, three runs, and whatever else happened. But, I mean, some of the rules – but the best one is, hey, folks – we're going to steal first base. Oh, yeah. The only way that I know how to steal first base is with a gun and a mask. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in the south side of Chicago. That's why I say it. <laughs> uh, but all the, right. We got another one back here. Denny, I wonder if you could talk to us about your final pitch to Mickey Mantle. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey who? Who was it? <laughs> Mickey, Mickey was my idol. Uh, no question. I mean, I grew up uh, in the south side of Chicago, and the Cubs were my team, but Mantle was my guy. As a matter of fact, when I was probably 10 or 11 years old, I was probably worth, in today's market, probably $30, $40 million. I had Mickey Mantle in my front spikes, and I had Al Kaline in my back spikes. They're rookie cards. And uh, <laughs> when, I, when, I signed, when I signed my contract, I was 18 years old, and uh, they came out to the house Seven or eight clubs came out. We, my mother, for some reason, my mother was a Polish Jew, by the way. Uh, so we had kind of a crazy house because my father was an Irish Catholic. <laughs> and uh, oh, it was nuts man. in that house. And uh, 
when I when I got ready to sign, my, first of all, my dad died when I was 13, so it was me and my mom and my brother, and then all my uncles who thought they were uh, the, the agents that were about to be named to somebody's team, and although all four of my <laughs> uncles were cops, so yeah. you know you got to be careful when you talk around a guy that carries a gun all the time. <laughs> so uh, the first guys come out, the Cubs came out, and they offered me uh, five thousand dollars, and my mother says, "Well, thank you very much. We'll we'll think about it." Uh, and the St. Louis Cardinals came, the Milwaukee Brewers came, and everybody was like five, six, seven thousand dollars. And then the Yankees came, and the guy drove up. He was the only guy that really drove up in a brand new car, brand, brand new black Cadillac. He was impeccably dressed, beautiful blue suit, white shirt, great tie. I mean, the guy just looked great. And uh, brand new shoes, I thought. I mean, it really looked super. Uh, and the Yankees offered me 17.5 to uh, join the Yankees. <clears throat> well, that's all I had to hear. We, but my mother wouldn't let me say yes or no. And she says, no matter what they say, don't you open your mouth. I'll let you know what we're going to do. <laughs> so uh, knowing her volatility, I, I, I chose to b obey for a change. So the next team that showed up were the um, uh, Chicago White Sox. This is the last team. There were seven or eight of them that Sunday. And uh, with that crew that came out from the Chicago White Sox, remember, I'm living in Chicago, so it's only a 30-minute drive. Even back then, it was only 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, the guys that came with the farm director, a guy by the name of Mr. Miller and the general manager of the ball club, uh, Ed Short, uh, was um, – Nellie Fox, second baseman with the White Sox, Hall of Famer. Minnie Minoso, for those of you who remember the name. And um, uh, the shortstop, uh, uh, Aparicio. 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 Those three guys were there in my house. And I'm 18 years old, and I, I, I much less impressed. I couldn't even speak. Uh, so we went through the whole thing, and, and uh, at the end of the conversation, uh, my uh, mother says, okay, we'll call you guys either tonight or tomorrow, and we'll let you know what's going on. So, And I'm convinced I'm going to the Yankees. Mickey Mantle is my guy. I mean, I don't care about Aparicio. I don't care about anybody. I'm going to play with Mickey Mantle. I mean, just think about that. I've got every baseball card he ever had, including the gum, and uh, I just didn't want Mickey Mantle to get out of my life. So... Uh, when it's all over with, my uncles are talking to my mother, and of course I'm sitting in the other room where I was told to be. <laughs> and uh, they finally, well, what do you think? Which, where do you want to go? I said, it's foregone. I said, I'm going to the Yankees. My mother said, you are not going to the Yankees. I said, what are you talking about? He offered the same money as the White Sox, 17-5, 17-5. I said, doesn't make, what's the difference? He's, let me t she says, let me tell you the difference. Let me tell you the difference because you don't look at things very well. I said, all right, go ahead, Mom. She says, did you see his shoes? I says, Mom, he had brand new shoes on, beautiful tie, the suit. I said, you're driving a brand new Cadillac, Mom. Just unbelievable. And she said, you didn't see his shoes. Said, his shoes got to do with it. I'm, gonna, I'm a pitcher. I don't care what shoes he wears. And she says, listen. His left foot, did you notice it? I said, what the are you talking about? <laughs> he had a hole in his left shoe. I said, okay. She said, if they can't afford to get him a good pair of shoes, do you think that check is good? Oh, my God. <laughs> that was my mother in 1962. So I signed with the White Sox. I had oh no choice, God. otherwise she was going to kill me. <laughs> so two, two mornings later, uh, they put me on a pl first time I'd ever been on a plane, first time I'd ever been out of Chicago, and they put me on a plane, the, a DC-6 that flew from O'Hare to, um, I think it went to Knoxville, and then I took a bus from Knoxville to Harlan, Kentucky. And uh, when I got to uh, O'Hare, I'm scared to death. I mean, and I told my mother, I said, I don't want to play ball anymore. I just want to. I want to go work where my dad worked. And she, he's, uh, she, she looked at me and she said, your father worked in a factory all of his life and drove a truck. Is that what you want? 
I said, I don't want to go to Knoxville. I don't want to go to Harlem. I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to stay home. I, I said, never been out of Chicago. What, what, do I, what do I think? And she said, you're going to Harlem. That's all there is to it. That's it. Shut up. So uh, I flew down there. And, of course, the first flight in my life was probably the worst flight I ever had in my life. Scared the peep out of me. And uh, we, get to, we get to Knoxville, and if you think that flight was bad, you should have been on that bus going through those mountains all the oh, way to Harlan, Kentucky. Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, and we got in there at midnight. And here's the best part of the trip. When we get off the bus, you had to walk a block. Now, Harlan, Kentucky in June is like 120 in the shade at, at any time of day. So I walk up the stairs, and there's this old guy with a beard down to here and a dog over there. I don't know what kind of a dog, but it looked like one of those TV movie dogs, you know. And every <laughs> time you went to make a move, the dog would growl a little bit, and he would spit into the spittoon. <laughs> and he'd spit right in front of you. Toom, you know. And he says, what do you want? I said, I, I got to go see the manager. Well, he's in bed now for the last couple of hours, and I don't <laughs> think you want to bother him right now. I said, no, I, I got about him. I was told to go right to his uh, room when I got here. I don't think so. <laughs> and he says, I'm in charge of the hotel after 11 o'clock, and you're not getting in. You're kind of a <laughs> from up north, aren't you? I said, sir, I'm not a <laughs> and all I want to do is go see the manager. He said, Mr. McClain, you sit <laughs> down over there in that chair. And when I think it's time for you to go, you go. You know what time you let me go? 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> I was scared to death of the dog. I just knew that dog was about to bite something I, I thought was very precious. And uh, boy, oh boy, you talk about scared to death. That, that was it. But uh, got there, and the, uh, two nights later, I'm pitching in Harlan, Kentucky. And uh, the first game I ever pitched in professional baseball was a no-hitter. I win, I win one to nothing, struck out 16, and then uh, four days later I pitched. Think about that. Now I'm 18, and we're pitching every fourth day in 18 back then. So I'm pitching the fourth day. I got beat the next time, one to nothing, struck out 14, and they sent me to Clinton, Iowa. And, uh, and, and the reason I bring the Clinton, Iowa thing up, the Tigers this past year when we celebrated the 50th anniversary in Detroit for the 68 World Series team, um, by the way, John and I, between us, we won 35 games together. It pretty much carried the club, man. Yeah, he carried the yeah, club. Yeah, we cool. and I had four. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the Tigers gave everybody a uh, bobble night. A bobble night. They did a bobblehead night. Everybody got one except Eddie McLean. Just to show you my good relationship that I had there. <laughs> and uh, when the Clinton, the team, Clinton, Iowa was the first after the uh, Harlan, Kentucky team, I went to Clinton, Iowa, and uh, Clinton found out about me not getting a bobblehead, so they called me and said, listen, we've got a bobblehead for you. We want you to come to Clinton, Iowa. We'll do it the right way. And they took us up to Clinton, Iowa, gave away 5,000 bobbleheads for it. I mean, it was unbelievable what a night it was, and we just had a great time, and Clinton, Iowa will always be in my heart. Except for that night at the casino. Yeah. That had to be a big <laughs> head on a bobblehead, wasn't it? They had your head on one? Yeah. <laughs> like, really? Like putting a cantaloupe on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. <laughs> hey, they like it. So really, back to the original question, oh, I don't think yeah, you ever what, got an was answer. Was there a question? There's there? a question? <laughs> what was the last pitch to Mickey Mantle? Oh, that's your guy. Oh, my guy again. See, that's what I got throwing you off. Uh, I uh, threw him a nice fastball about 50 miles an hour. Uh, well, you had a, him on, too. I had him on, too. Trying that's to strike right. him out. No, I wasn't going to strike him out. <laughs> I when I got him on, too, I was going to strike him out because he had he'd taken the first two pitches. And right. I'm, I know then I'm not working with a Rhodes Scholar. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Farm boy. I mean, I throw him two of these. Two of these in a row, both are strikes. He doesn't swing at anything. Now I finally yelled down to him. I said, where the hell do you want it? Just tell me. And he said, you know, here. And I uh, said, okay, threw another one. And uh, he fouled this one off down the right field line. Just well, you remember just, that. Yeah. Just foul, man. I mean, and just barely fouled. I remember that like it was yesterday. And then I, then I yelled again, and I said, are you sure that's where you want it? And he said, yeah, right here, right yeah, here. Put just his above, hand out. Yep, put that's his hand it. right out over the plate. And threw the next pitch. 
And uh, he hit it 19 miles, just oh. out over the ballpark. It was gone forever Crushed. and ever and ever. Everybody, I mean, Cash took his glove off, shook his hands. Everybody Every shook his hands. Every one of our guys shook his hands. Oh, it, it was quite a moment for all of us. And then and then what happened is uh, Joe Pepitone was the next hitter. Yeah. And Joe was crazy. Joe uh, was playing probably with three fingers and about seven seven ounces of brain. Uh, <laughs> but a great guy, just a terrific guy. In fact, he made the greatest play. I don't know if you'll remember this, but he made the greatest play I ever saw. There were men on uh, first and second. Nobody out was against the Cleveland Indians. Pretty good memory for an old guy, 99 That's good. That's years good. old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Duke Sims was the hitter. And uh, Duke, the first pitch, fake, got out in front of home plate like he was going to bunt the guy in first and second over to second and third, right? So uh, he misses the first one, and the next thing, Duke does this again. Well, as soon as Norm Cash at first base sees him bending over to bunt the ball again, Norm comes running in, running in as fast as Norm can run. He's trying to get the ball, throw to second for a double play. Well, Duke crossed him up, and he hit a line drive as hard as I've ever seen a man hit a ball 30 feet. <laughs> Norman caught the ball 30, 35 feet from home plate, and I mean it was a shot and a half. And he caught it. <laughs> he caught it and threw the guy out at second base for the double play. I'll, it's the greatest play I ever saw because the ball uh, was not here. The ball was over here. So here he's left-handed, and he had to reach across to catch the ball. I, it was just unbelievable. Anyway, that, So when Pepitone yes. came up. So anyway, yeah. He, he's digging a hole. <laughs> really he, he's digging a hole to China. You know, he's, he's digging down, and he just gave Mantle the home run. So, so anyway, so Peppy looks out at Denny, and Denny looked at him. He goes, and Denny nods and "Yeah, right there. I'll bring it in there." Pshoom, <laughs> right under his chin, he almost knocked him, him. Knocked him right, <laughs> right on his and head. I, and I said, "I said, so you want another one of those?" He said, "No, no, no." He said, "But why'd you try to kill me? I'm a friend. I'm still in baseball. This, that the other guy hit the home run. He's quitting. He's quit. He's already announced. What do you? Why didn't you knock him down? For Christ's sake! He said, "You knock me down. I'm your friend. I'll take you to Broadway shows next year. I'll buy you dinner. I'll take you to Phil Lindsay's bar. He said, Whatever you want, I'll take. But just give me the pitch." And I said, and I'm screaming at him. I said, "Listen, Joe, I know Mickey Mantle, and you ain't him." Yeah. Well, Mantle's your man. Mantle was my guy. And, I, and as a matter of fact, Mickey worked for me. For I used to import TV sets in the middle after I got out of baseball in the in the middle late seventies, and uh, Bo Sai from uh, Taiwan, and uh, Mickey worked for us for about three or four months. It was just uh, it was terrific to be working with him. The stories, the camaraderie, the chatter, and uh, man, I'll tell you one thing. If you had vodka in the building, he had it. Uh, I've never seen a man drink so much in my life. and uh, he, I never uh, knew he drank until I saw him sober one day. <laughs> so, uh, I'm telling you. I've so never was, seen a guy drink TVs so much in, in my life. Yeah. Well, see, not, see, man was from Oklahoma. Right. They didn't have TVs out no, there. No, they didn't so have TVs. He sold them like <laughs> he killed him out there. Yeah. Oh, he was something. He was. Uh, they just got electricity the year before. And 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 I say this with all due respect to every woman in the building. The women loved him. They lined up. They absolutely lined up. And and had he put numbers on the wall, they would have taken numbers. I think yeah. there's some guys on our team that was taking the number. Or two. Well, I, I, I don't want to brag about it or anything. But oh, you, you know, don't want to brag about yeah, it. I don't want to say that. <laughs> I was single and just, you know, I I just go back to the room and read a book. Were you single? Yeah. Well, how could you be single? You were married 55 years now. No, 48. Oh, 48. You're just starting. married 48 years, man. You're just starting. I was just a puppy, yeah, 48 years. Same woman, thank you. Before I left the house, before I left the house, I get a little sentimental uh, because, you know, hate to be away from her, but I said, honey, just remember, 9-11 is our anniversary. It was our 48. Is it really? Yeah, 48. I said, uh. Those 48 years feel like 48 minutes <laughs> underwater. <laughs> <laughs> she loves that. I bet she yeah. does. I bet that goes over it now. Yeah, really like a lead balloon. And I've been married now uh, 56 years. 56. Yeah. Man. Yeah. In my case, I can't get rid of her. She knows too much. <laughs> yeah, I was going to write a book, but I still got too many relatives alive. <laughs> <laughs> we had a writer. Well, you've written a couple books. Yeah. Who else has a question out here? Yep. 
Comment on the games and why they take so long to uh, to play out. Seems like it's an extra hour or something. Well, the, the TV one is uh, social media and all that stuff. See, because now everything. I mean, the whole all be so every club's financed by the billion dollar contracts of Fox and and uh, NBC and ESPN and all these networks, and they got to advertise. They got that throw it advertising out there, and then now they, they have a five-man rotation. And some of these managers, you talk about idiots, why would you keep 12 pitchers? But they have a five-man rotation. They use like six guys. I mean, every day there's six or seven guys in the bullpen. And every time they change pitchers, that's five minutes. He's got to come in, they talk with blah, blah, and then he goes, pitches, then all of a sudden, like Denny was saying, he throws the one guy. You know, the day they talk about guys who are like left-handed specialists, he'd only come in to face that big lefty. Well, if they get that rule change, that yep. guy's out of a job. Yep. He's done. Because they don't want him throwing the next two guys that are right-handed home run hitters. Of course, now everybody's a home run hitter. Holy cow. Yeah, and, and yet, when they talk about relief pitchers, with this new rule of where a relief pitcher's got to pitch at three guys, they want to add a player to each roster, which makes no sense at all because yeah, all they ever do is cut guy. people. Yeah. And then there's something going on right now. I don't know how many of you know this, but they're trying to reduce, cut out 50% of the minor league teams and start to use and incorporate the colleges more like uh, football has and basketball has. And you know what? That won't work in professional yeah. baseball. You're going to you're going to reduce the quality of the product to somewhere no, nobody's going to want to see it. And the, one of the other reasons why the games take so long today is they did an, an analysis about three, four years ago about strikes versus strikes. In other words, strikes in the 60s and 70s and people throwing strikes in the 2000s uh, now, c currently, in the last 20, 25 years. They found that 85% of the starting pitchers were throwing strikes in the 60s and 70s. 85% of the pitches tossed were strikes. You know, not always the best strike, but it was a strike. Uh, versus the guys today, it's 60% or less. 60. So there are your extra pitches. These guys, when we pitch, and, and, and this is not a bragocious, this is just fact. When we pitched, if I pitched a complete game, I threw 110 to 115 pitches. Normally, that's what I would pitch. And I would do it in two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. But that's because we threw so many strikes. So did the relief pitchers. They didn't come in there and tittle around and, and try to nibble, get Nibble, nibble, nibble. These guys want to nibble. That's all they they're, do. They're afraid of contact. They pitch away from contact. The guy who pitched the other night uh, for the, for the uh, team that lost. Astros. The Astros. He... Did you ever see anybody throw so many change-ups and so many balls off the plate? Yeah. And did you ever see so many bad swings in your life as these guys with the other club? I mean, I we never used to see – we never saw that. Where guys – can you imagine K-Line chasing a pitch this far outside? Or yeah. Horton or anybody like that? I can't. I, I never, sit there and tell them, like, how can a guy that's in the big leagues, one of the greatest players in the world, there's 650, the only guys that are in the big leagues – and they'll swing at a pitch in the other batter's box. Yeah. And like, what would what he done if he'd have hit it? You know, man. Yeah, where's a, the ball going where's anyway? Where's the ball going to yeah. go? Yeah. Uh, how do they not see that? So it's unbelievable. It's it's amazing. Uh, I tell you, there's a lot of a lot of people, a lot of major league players. Uh, if they had 16 teams like we played. Eight and eight in each leg. Oh man, they'd be on the farm picking melons. Because remember, we first yeah. got to the big leagues, we only had eight teams in each league. Uh, so you can imagine how good the talent was, pitching wise and hitting wise and playing wise. Uh, and then of course they went to twenty or twenty two and twenty four and then thirty two. But uh, it's it's unbelievable where the talent's gone. They did not allow the talent to catch up to the number of players. And uh, so they're going to pay for it for a while. And I think that's why they're stepping up these new rules with, you know, you can steal first base. They did that in the uh, Atlantic League. And, uh, yeah. It's an independent league. They're not affiliated with anybody. Yep. But they put that in there. If the catcher misses a third strike or the pitcher throws a wild pitch up on the screen, the guy can take off for first and yeah. get to first and be safe. He's safe. That's about the Can you dumbest, imagine? That's about the dumb.
thing I've ever seen. And I think life. the other dumb thing is, and it, it doesn't really seem to be that big of a deal to a lot of people, but over a period of time it will be, where you you step up in the batter's box and I'm the pitcher and I say, take first base. Yeah. Do you know how many times a year somebody reaches across home plate and hits a single to right field or a ball up the middle? Or, it happens all the or time. Or the pitcher throws one over the catcher's head. Yeah. The guys advance anyway. I mean, that's just part of the game. This is a game that there's no shouldn't be a clock around because it's an untimed game. One of the few sports it's an untimed event. You just go out and it's nine innings. And when I, when you go to a game, I go to a game. I'm still a fan, you yeah. know, and I like to watch the games. You know, I expect to spend three hours or three and a half. I you know, what are you going to do? What, I mean, you can't. You went to the game. You want to see it. And talking about eight eight teams in each league, you have injuries. You you play with them, man. Because if you go out of the lineup, somebody's got your job. Daryl Evans has been there before, right? Yeah. I don't know if he told you, 21 years, was never on the DL. Never. Never on the DL, 21 years. You look in the paper now, after the first month of the season, almost every team's got four or five guys. On look the, at the Yankees. They oh. had nine and ten guys on the DL. Yeah, 16 the or 18 for the season. Yeah, unbelievable. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. And these guys are supposed to be – the best honed athletes and best nutrition, and they're bigger, stronger, faster, but something's wrong. And I don't know if you noticed, but the guys that pitched the last two games in, for each league, American and National League, they didn't pitch very well. They didn't pitch very yeah, well. Did. Everybody was walking a lot of guys, everybody giving up some base hits, but n nonetheless, they didn't pitch well. The, the, and I don't know if they were nibbling or if they just – didn't understand that this was a little bit out of their rhythm to have to pitch that quickly after the last time they had pitched. But, uh, yeah, we uh, – those are the things that I notice, it, it, how quick they – when if they get their complete turn, five days, six days, a lot of them get, they, they're much more comfortable out there. And I don't know why because – and I mean this from the bottom of my heart – there's no difference between the fourth day and the fifth day until you get late in the season when it begins to wear on you a little mm -hmm. bit or a lot of bit at times. But, you know, a fifth day is like having a week off. I'm telling you, it's, it's – uh, I hated a fifth day because it got me out of my rhythm. Yeah. It really did. And the relief pitchers are the same way, man. If they, if they don't pitch, they don't pitch well. And so you need these guys to do what they do all the time and just keep pitching and pitching and pitching. Hiller and I used to like to go out and, you know, throw down a few and – we always knew when Denny and Mickey threw back to back, we had two nights off. We didn't we didn't have to worry about pitching the next two days because they were not coming out of the game. And I I know from the cash and freehand talking, Mayo would go to the bounce sometimes, and Denny would go, what are "You doing out here? What do you want? You got anybody better than me?" And he then, come, oh, no, no, Denny, no. He I, come out. He just want to see how you're doing. He come out uh, one oh, night. I, the first three hitters I pitched you that night. I hit one, the second guy broke an, uh, 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 an error at second base, and the third guy I walked. So I got bases loaded, nobody out, ball's barely been touched, and Freehand <laughs> comes out to the mound and he says, are you okay? I said, what do you mean? He says, he says, you haven't been out here four minutes yet, and they got the bases loaded. Baltimore Orioles, who I had a little bit of trouble with from time to time, and he says, um, <laughs> uh, you know, he's, you got to calm down. I said, calm down? What the f are you talking about, calm down? I said, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready, let's go. He said, oh, God, look what's going on now. And I turned, here comes Mayo from the dugout. So Mayo comes out to the mound, and he says, oh, well, 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 what's, what's, what's going on? What's going on out here? I said, Mayo, you're missing the game if you're not watching. <laughs> so, and he starts to do this speech about, are you ready? Anything hurting, your butt, your knees, your toes, your arm, your shoulder, any, I want no excuses. Are you okay? I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. I said, ask freehand. He turned to free in and he said, Bill, how's this stuff tonight? Bill says, how the f would I know I haven't caught a <laughs> thing yet? <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, by the oh, way. Oh, man. Oh, Mayo. Yeah. We really had some characters on that team, too, boy. We really did. When uh, when Alex Bregman hit the, the home run and he carried his bat to first base, if that happened when you guys played, mm. what would have happened? Go ahead. Well, you might want to be in a flak jacket on the next time you hit. 
It's just, you know, and, and I, even one of the announcers, or they were going, oh, this stupid, uh, no, you know, un, un, unruled, you know, like uh, rules that aren't really in the book, but, you know, you don't hit a guy, you don't show a guy up, you don't bunt with an 18-run lead, you know, that's that, that type of thing. Uh, yeah, he probably would have wore one. I mean, it's, that's just something you don't do. Yeah, you you just don't do it. That, that's stupid. And, and then, of course, and, and yeah. I don't think they were really trying to show anybody up. To be honest with you, I really I, don't. I didn't think he was. But but, but then he dropped it, and the first base coach exactly. wasn't expecting. Then he dropped it right by like the uh, first base bag. Well, then when Turner or one of the, uh, somebody from the Soto. Nationals, Soto. Soto. Soto, he's a hot dog, ain't he too? He's full of mustard. So he hits one and he carries his bat down to first. So you know, I mean, just I tell you one thing: he hit one there there that week. It was unbelievable. Yeah, the one he, in the upper deck. Yeah, about four hundred and twenty-five feet. Man. But yeah, it, it's just uh, some of those things, you know. That uh, nobody, you know, nobody, flipped, like, I don't care. Up, what, nobody flipped her bat up yeah, in the air or and, stuff like that. And you know yourself that you just whether it's intentional or not, and I we know they're celebrating the moment. Don't celebrate the moment when I'm on the mound or he's on the mound. I mean, because that's just, it's just not a nice thing to do. Go in the dugout and cheer with your guys. You yeah. Know, don't, don't, don't bother. They, they, I don't know if you saw their little boom, 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 boom on the bench. Yeah, there's. I don't know what all that is. I mean, I have no <laughs> idea. That's all those Latin players. <laughs> they get the. You know. I don't get it. I just don't get it. And, yeah. uh, and I know they're not. Sending it across the field to the other team. I mean, I, I I don't think they're smart. If they're doing that on the bench, they're not smart enough to throw it across the field. There's no, just no, no way. It's, it's going to stay there. It's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. Yeah. But the things they do today, um, it's just a whole different atmosphere out there right now. And um, and I don't know where it ends, uh, but uh, they're going to have to make some serious adjustments, especially with the pitching. You know, they even talked about moving the mound back six inches to a foot. Do you yes. know what that would do? Oh, my God. I had the greatest, and I'm not kidding, I had the greatest fork ball in the world uh, from 60 feet 6 inches. No, I take that back. From 59 feet 6 inches. Because, and I mean, when I threw it from 59 or 58 feet, this my fork ball would just disappear. I mean, absolutely disappear. But when I moved it back to 60 feet 6 inches where you had a pitch from, it still disappeared, but it was 460 feet behind. The other way. <laughs> and it's those kinds of things that, uh, you know, you work on all the time, you work on all the time, and now they, they want to move the mound back a yeah. foot. I say That's crazy. there's one thing they could do to help the pitchers and everybody else in the game. Re raise the mound yep. to 16 inches again. Let the pitchers pitch and let them do what they do. And I'll guarantee you, you'll have fewer injuries. Because you've got better leverage, you've added another six inches of leverage where we used to have it. You've got all the things going for you. The mound then becomes, it's not straight down, by the way, if it's contoured right. And it's just its just a layer, you know, layered right on down. And, uh, boy, if they would do that, and, I, and I've offered my opinion to every commissioner we've had the last 20 years, nobody wants to listen. Well, they got their own ideas. The, Other the, questions the, from anybody? Yeah, I got a question. Just curious to what you guys' perspective, personal perspectives are on the new NCAA rules. I know Denny, he didn't go to Notre Dame like you were supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just the new rules. You mean, with oh, the, with the, uh, you for, the for the kids getting paid? Yeah. I think it's a great thing. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great thing. I, I, uh, The kids have waited too long. All these coaches have become multi, multi, multi millionaires. The university are billion dollar universities. Uh, the universities take care of themselves, and in, in, in a lot of cases, a uh, perfect example is MSU. They, they don't want to watch what's going on a lot of times. Boy, that thing is a long way from over with, too, folks. Well, Get ready for what we just heard. Ooh, did I hear something the other day. Uh, and we'll probably talk about it on our show in the next couple of weeks, but we're trying to confirm one thing. Uh, but, uh, boy, there's a coach over there that's got big trouble, big-time trouble. And that's one of the reasons why that big time coach this year is not doing very well. Um, but uh, well, yeah, I think if you pay the kids, they don't penalize the coaches. The coaches get right. They get the school in trouble. Well, this one is, and they they leave and go somewhere else, and leave those kids stranded, being ineligible to go to a bowl game, can't do this, can't do that, 
and this guy goes to XYZ school out in Arizona. He's out there coaching, making his five, six million dollars. And to the kids, and they said, how can we pay these kids and still make him be an amateur? Well, that's sort of an oxymoron. Right. If you're going to pay a kid, and he's not, he's not an amateur anymore. But I could see if they would set up an annuity or something in that kid's name, and they earn X number of dollars that's recorded, that's put in his account at the end of his senior year, then they could give him that money. That's just the way I was. I just thought of that, and I think it an idea. Well, I, I think, too, I don't think people realize that a lot of kids go to school to play football. They don't go for an education. They go to play football yeah. or basketball or baseball. Now, obviously, they don't, they don't go to school to play soccer and, uh, because we just don't have that kind of a setup yet. One day we'll have soccer in this country in a major way, in an, an appropriate way. But uh, right now, it, it, I think it's still at a minimum 10 to 20 years away from being organized well enough to play. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, these kids deserve the money. They're the ones that, uh, yes, the colleges have supported them. Yes, the colleges have given out education. But this changed 25 or 30 years ago when kids started going to school just to play sports. I remember a few decades back, John Thompson over at Georgetown was a promoter of yeah. right. basically school for athletics. I've been saying it forever. See the just kids forever. Most of the kids from the inner city and the back basketball right. and the football, they can't afford it. And that's why you, they, they talked about, I know Joe Morgan and uh, a lot of the uh, the African American guys are upset about the low percentage of African Americans in in Major League Baseball, but you look at it, they can't. The way it's set up, most of them are one, one parent kid. They they don't want to have. They don't like the structure of a, of a baseball because they might have spent four years in minor leagues, making a thousand dollars a month or something like that for five months. Then they got to go get another job because that's the only time they're not. They haven't hit the big money yet. <laughs> Football and basketball, they're the first round, second round, third round pick. They're millionaires now. And that's why everybody, I coached at the University of Cincinnati for two years. The first year of conference USA came in, in the, in the league. And it just, it blew my mind away. We go to uh, Tulane, South Florida, UAB, uh, uh, Louisville, but there were like eight, nine teams. Notre Dame played in the baseball league with us. And I, I'm like, where's all the, where's all black kids? There's like six in the whole league, because they can't afford it. The coach of baseball, they get 11 scholarships, and they carry 35 guys. 11? 11, 11 point, there's four, it's like 11.5. Mm -hmm. And that's all, so they give you 1,000, they give you 500, you get 300, you get free books, you get tuition, then if they, sign a big studs out of, out of uh, state, they got to give him a full ride to bring him in from out of state, so there goes a whole scholarship, And but they, they can't afford to go to school. And so that's why you don't see a lot of them playing, and the numbers have just flipped. 20 years ago, there were 30% black players. Yeah. And yeah, now it's, that's that's 40% Latin and about 8% yeah. black. Yeah. yeah. Because they just don't, this baseball setup doesn't, fit their financial they, they want well, to be there uh, right now and the other the other situation is that um, you know some guys uh, want to play basketball some guys want to yeah. play football that's what they focused on when they were 8, 9, 10, 12 years old and you know you can't play every sport and you better pick the right one if you're going to even have an attempt but what, what when I when I do my talks at the schools the high especially the high schools I tell the kids don't worry about the major leagues. Major leagues will take care of you if you take care of it. In other words, find out how good you are. Maybe somebody will come along and give you a scholarship to college. That's worth a lot more than a major league salary is at, at that point in your life. And if you're good enough, something better will happen. But the bottom line is try to focus so hard that you wind up with a scholarship in a, a university where you can play whatever sport you want to play. But try to do that. Uh, but, you know, I think they, the kids who we pay a lot of attention to are the kids that um, 
uh, if you took the word I out of their vocabularies, a lot of them would be speechless. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. uh, that's, and, that's, and that's a shame because that comes from mom and dad and the uncles and aunts and how, telling them all of his life how good he is. And uh, yes, we got to tell our kids they're good kids and that they can do this and they can do that. But uh, somewhere along the line, uh, things changed. And, and not that I want to compare my life to anybody else. My, as I said, my dad died when I was 13. And when my dad died, I don't think, not that I recall that he ever said, boy, nice game, nice going, boy, am I proud of you. What he would say is, boy, why did you throw that damn pitch to the one guy? Why, why, why? I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I said, dad, you, know. you <laughs> hit me. <laughs> well, my dad never hit me. He, he left home when I was three. I don't pants too much or, or what but uh yeah, i grew up without a father in a little small farm town they talk about where does some some of the players come from uh mickey mantle his man binger or not binger but uh, out in oklahoma some oh yeah random town that yeah, and mickey had the same type of thing he had, his family all died the, from men, the same disease the same disease in their 40s was that black coal or something well, right? the black something coal like and that. the osteomyelitis cancer yeah. of the knees and right. stuff and Mickey really, he he lived, he he burnt that candle at both ends. I'm telling you guys. Are you guys aware what happened to Mickey Mantle the first major league game he ever played? He finally got a start. John is, John is. He finally John got is. he finally got a start to play with Joe DiMaggio. DiMaggio was this was going to be one of the last games DiMaggio ever played in center field, and they put Mickey in right for this one day. And the last thing DiMaggio said to Mickey in the, before the game started was, you get everything. I'm not running after everything. You get everything, Mickey. So about the fourth or fifth inning, Mickey is going after, he's running like <laughs> trying to catch a fly ball because he knows Joe isn't going to be there. And just as Mickey was going to catch the ball, and Mickey's going full trot, Joe says, I got it, I got it, I got it. And Mickey stopped trying to stop on a dime and slid on the cover to the sprinkler system, and that's the first time he yeah. screwed up the leg, and he lived with that thing for 18 years. Yeah. That's the first game, the fourth or fifth inning of his career. That's how he heard it. First he, game. He could outrun anybody in the major leagues. Oh man, that guy was lightning. Going he from was home to first, he was lightning. And you know, people used to get mad at him because he would bunt once in a while. You know, if you could run like him, I'd bunt every time, for yeah, Christ's sake. Yeah. I mean, the guy was – and when he hit home runs, especially from the left side, uh, I'm telling you, there there was a distinct sound to a ball coming off his bat. Sounded like a shotgun. Uh, I'm telling you, um, it, it was – he hit the ball so hard. Yeah. That, that was the thing. He hit the ball so ding-dang hard. And there aren't very many of those people that come along very often. Although this kid the other night hit one the other night, I'm telling you, the kid's going to be yeah. some if he stays healthy. Yeah. Kind of a two-part question for you, okay. John. Uh, you went from single A up to the 68 Tigers. Going into spring training, what was your expectations of that? Well, I'll tell you uh, well, I'm going to hear this. Our man, <laughs> we're talking about throwing a lot of innings, but our uh, man, my manager at uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, my second year, uh, I went 15 11. Who was your manager? Al Federoff. Oh my God. See, the first year I played Daytona Beach. And a 19 year old kid, flat top right off the farm, man. <whistles> Pocket full of money. I got 15 grand to sign. How about that? It's pretty good for know, a left hander. I, I know, for a lefty. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I, I, at the end of the first half of the season in, in Florida State League, I was like 2 and 9. And our manager got me in between. We had uh, played two halves. So for the second half started, I said, look, we're going to have the junior draft. We're going to have a lot of good players. We're going to draft some kids, blah, blah, blah. He said, do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, any chance you can get maybe two, three hours of sleep at night? Because I was out on the beach. I mean, they had the racetrack. They had the dog track. They had a horse track. They had a speedway. They had girls flying in there every other week. Spring break, man. Made a, made a Labor Day. So anyway, the next year, Go to Rocky Mount. We took a train, and the tracks ran right through the middle of town. I was 11 and 2 at the middle of the season. <laughs> there was nothing to do, man. So, anyway, I, I had a good year, and he said, I'm going to recommend you for the major league roster. I said, What does that mean? And I'm making 550 a month. First year, I made 400. I got a 
That's raised 150 a month. That was for all five months. Big check, big checks. And uh, so I said, you go to spring training. You'll be in the regular locker room. You get $200 a week, meal money. I went, 200 a week? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm making five fifty a month. I'm gonna get two hundred a week. I said I'm hiding out in the bathroom. They'll never find me, man. I don't want to get sent down. So anyway, the history of '67. They had a great team in '67, and he he gets hurt. He doesn't what one decision in in I September. Pitched, I pitched two innings in the month of September. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so take that out of the equation, and then I. Told him now. I said, yeah, I told Kayla. I said, if you guys would have brought me up to end of, <laughs> it was, in the end of uh, '67, we'd have won back to back. So anyway, I go to spring training, and I'm thinking, my mom and I, and my sister grew up. We were on that farm in Columbus, outside of Columbus, and uh, I thought, man, if I just make that Toledo team, that'd be awesome. Make it to Triple A. That's the way you my, think. My too. mom That's could, true. my mom yeah. could come and see me play, and you know, and everything. And, and I'm just thinking, I just. And Johnny Sane was our pitching coach. And he knows, I know, Jim Cott, you talk to him. Guys, ever, anybody that's ever had him as a pitcher, he's the greatest. He was Koufax, the Drysdale, Koufax, Mary they all swear all by these him. Guys. Yankee pitchers are great ones. So anyway, he would just work with us, and he never tried to make you pitch like he pitched. Right. He would give you ideas. Hey, why don't you try to just turn on that ball and just sort of give a little turn at the end there, just turn and pull. And, Reach back for a little extra, you know. And, extra, and yeah. So, I got. I, I thought I'll never get in the game anyway. I'm, a, I'm, you know, <laughs> two years in a ball. So I get in the game, get them out. Oh, that was fun. So they got about 28 pitchers because they invite guys back then. You know, they'd have different guys. So there's a ton of pitchers, and I had a list in my room. And every time I'd watch Mayo Smith, and he'd walk around the outfield with the fungo bat. He'd walk over to a guy and go, hey, you know. And that guy'd be hanging his head, go clean his locker out, went over to the minor league camp. I said, ha ha, I gotta hide from Mayo. <laughs> Cause that is, he doesn't even know my name. He doesn't even know I'm there. So I got in another game, got him out, got another game, got him out. And uh, unbeknownst to me till and maybe five, six years ago, my daughter had taken all my clippings and my mom saved. And in spring training in 68, I led the team in strikeouts. How about the Where in spring training? Spring training in 68. I led the team in strikeouts. Did you get a trophy or anything from No, me? but I I bought myself one. It was pretty nice. It's about that. You know, I want to let you know, we we starters don't care about strikeouts in spring training. Oh, I know. Well, we we single A players are dying to we, – we'd bite our finger off to get to the big leagues. We do. So, anyway, I'm having – just a really good spring, and it came down. They started really. I'd, I'd go back to the room, cross the guy off, cross the guy off, down to 20 pitchers, whoop, 18, whoop, 16, 14. They sold Hank and Gary to the Dodgers. Oh, yeah. Hank's a lefty. And thank God they sold him. Oh, <laughs> he, he was a load. He couldn't. So. He was Molly Putz all he over. He was again. gone, and I'm going, but I got a chance to make his team. So the last weekend of the season, spring training, we're playing the Cardinals, which is ironic because they are the world champs, and we're going to play them the end of the season in the World Series. So, come in, ninth, tw- tenth, eleventh, and twelfth inning. They pitched four innings, shut them out, had like six strikeouts, maybe a walk, hit, no, you know, nothing. Wayne Comer came out the bottom of the twelfth, hits a home run to win the game. When that game was over. Go back to the hotel, and here's Wally Moses. He's got a little brown bag under his arm. He and Mayo are going to go knock that thing out, a little vodka. And uh, so he said, hey, kid, you didn't hear it from me. You just made the ball club today. I'm going, oh, <laughs> oh my God. I ran to my room. <laughs> Collect call for Jane Warden. My mom, what's the matter? Something happened. I said, yeah, Mom, I just made the big league. She goes, ah, we're screaming and laughing and crying and but I, I made the club. I just – and Johnny just, you know, would, they had a meeting. I asked Hal Narragon, who was our bullpen coach, and we just lost him August 31st. And Denny and I both have a special, special relationship with Hal. And uh, so I asked Hal, oh, eight or nine years ago, so what was that meeting like? 
when you guys came down to decide who, who was going to get in those final spots. And the thing people don't re, uh, forget about, two days before we left spring training, Martin Luther King gets assassinated. Oh, that's right. So yeah. the commissioner says, everybody stay in your camp. It's going to be a three-day delay before opening day. Well, now I'm nervous because I'm thinking, they're going to change their mind. They're going to get, they're going to get some guy out Toledo, you know, left-hander, Rooker or somebody. And so they, they stayed with Did we me. we have Rooker at the time? Yeah, tattoo? Rooker's in wow. AAA. Mayo asked He had pretty good stuff. He did. So Mayo asked Johnny room, Sane. He, he said, was also my roommate. He ruined with his luggage, huh? <laughs> Rooker? <laughs> <laughs> so Mayo, Mayo said, John, what about this warden kid? He said, Mayo, that kid's done everything we asked him to. He said he throws strikes. He's left-handed. We need him in the bullpen. And uh, he said, I think we should keep him. And he's like, all right. So that's I ended up in the second game of the year. We got beat opening day. Earl Wilson got uh, beat. Denny got pitch hit four in the seventh inning. He pitched the second game of the year, I believe. Red Sox at home. So I come in to my first appearance in Tiger State. I'm 21 years old. And I, I uh, first guy, Rico Petroselli, ground ball to Ray Oiler. Man, I know that's an out. He never misses. <laughs> right between the legs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> So then I, get, I give up a hit, get an out, walk a guy, get next two guys out, get out of there, bases loaded. And I walk back to the dugout. I'm going, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> and uh, so they're saying, goes, you're going back out there. Don't worry, you know, don't go anywhere. Well, the next three hitters, it was like Jerry Adair and Mike Andrews, a couple guys everybody loved to pitch to because they were sure outs. Well, the third guy was Jastrzemski. Now, you ever, you ever get a little little murmur in your leg, a little you know, muscle spasm? You mean like peeing down your leg? Yeah, like yeah. peeing down your leg. <laughs> Said like it was a big lump in there. Yeah. So, they, yes. So here comes freehand trotting out. Big 10 Bill gives that big trot. And I said, well, he's going to tell me how to pitch to you. Yes. He won the triple crown the year before. Yeah. They win the American League pennant by one game, which they shouldn't have won. They weren't the best team. We, so, really, we really were the best team. They were. Team they had a great team. Yeah. So uh, Bill says, hey, lefty, don't let Yaz beat us with a home run. <laughs> Bill, I never thought of that. Well, I'd have never thought of that. I said, no wonder you couldn't get into high State. You had to go to Michigan. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you like that, right? <laughs> you did? You probably don't like it. You're 1 in 14 against us the last 15 years. <laughs> So uh, I walk off that mound. I don't know if my feet ever touch the ground. First major league strikeout. I'm saying to myself, I own your ass. I own your <laughs> But that's, that, and then the bottom of the ninth, I was a scheduled leadoff hitter. Of course, the pitcher didn't hit. That the, or no, we did hit. We did my hit bad. Then, yeah. We did hit. But I was, I was leading off, and uh, Gates Brown pinch hit for me. And John Wyatt came in to pitch for the Red Sox, who we later acquired uh, from the Red Sox, and he hit one in the upper deck for a home run. And I'm, I'm cheering. Hey, we, we won. We're winning. All right, we, that's our first win. I'm going. Oh, I got the win. <laughs> so now I'm locker next to Lolich, Mister Insecurity. And he's right. He's here. We're going. Lucky. I'm like, what? Then you guys lose the pennant by one game. I just got that game today that we might have had last year. <laughs> so two days later, Cleveland comes in town. Guy on first, strike out the hitter. Freehand throws out the runner second. Horton comes up, two run double in the ninth, two and zero. <laughs> now the papers are on strike, right? So here's here's Mick and the writers are going. Excuse me, Mick. Hey John, what's it like getting those uh, two victories and they reach a? Oh, I'd look. <laughs> Your bubble's gonna burst. I said, geez, Mick, give it up. So and that's the way Mickey was. Very very oh, insecure. Insecure. He he uh, used the capital J all the time. Jealousy. Oh, yeah, big time. Terrible. Big time. Just terrible. Just. So now we got anybody like him in my life. We go to Chicago first road trip. I call my mom because we're going to be the game of the week. Usually it's the Yankees and whoever, but we got us and the White Sox. So mom, get that big TV. I bought you. Remember, I got to be somewhere Tuesday. <laughs> I'm just answering his question. All right, this is the last one. I mean, it's like reading the Bible for grace. Okay, well, uh, 
You can sleep in till seven tomorrow. So anyway, we go to Chicago, come in the ball game. Now nine. this is when the season had started. Started. Okay. Yeah, we lost so many days, and we won nine in a row. So I come in the ninth inning, bomb the ninth, bases loaded. Who had started that game? That was uh, you. <laughs> that was you. Another one that I come in there and helped you out. Yeah. Couldn't finish it up, so I thought, well, take you off the hook, big guy. So anyway, I come in, bases loaded. Bases and, were not. No, no, first, first and second. My bad. First and second. First and second. They Wayne. weren't first and second. Yeah, they were because Wayne Causey came up, left-hand hitter. They took me out of the game at the break in the inning. You came in in the next inning. No, I came in with guys on base. Yeah. I would never trust you to leave men on base. <laughs> so I walk Wayne Causey on four pitches. Bases were loaded. You walked the guy? Yeah, he came in. Left-handed. That tied the game because we were up one. So now the game's tied. I can get the win if I get him out. So now Ken Boyer comes up, base is loaded, only one out. This Ken Boyer is a player. He was. was towards the end of his career, but he was a good player of the Cardinals. So I thought, well, Mayo will take me out. You know, bring in the right-hander. Naturally, they'll play the percentage. Mayo was in the dugout, so like, <laughs> Mayo dozed off. Denny did everything he did, but he didn't. Uh, so I guess, I guess I'm pitching to Ken Boyer. <whistles> Hung a slider, he hits a P, a rocket. Right to Don Wart, third base. Catches, steps on third. Double play. Top of the 10th, Horton. Two run double. Boom. 3 0. <laughs> All those are my wins. No, I got one of Lois's. Two are yours, one of Lois. So now a guy comes in from Sports Illustrated. He said, Holy cow, John. Three and a third innings, you're 3 0. What kind of year do you think you're going to have? I said, I should win 45, 50 games. <laughs> I'm nice. Nice. That's it. Okay. You need to go to bed, Lenny Pie? No, I'm enjoying Where's the waitress? She needs some hot milk and some cookies <laughs> for Denny. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that still holds the record for a reliever in his first three appearances. Yeah, I'm the only, I'm only reliever in baseball history with three uh, uh, wins in his first three appearances. Yep. Relief pitchers is a key word. A starter to do it all the time, but relief's tough. It is tough, but I, I don't want to brag about it, but I was pretty damn good. <laughs> yeah. hey, did, you, he mentioned uh, Hanky Gary. I want to tell you about Hanky Gary real quick. Uh, oh, Hank, was a, <laughs> Hank, was a, Hank was a veteran, been in the big leagues eight, nine, ten years, and you would think a veteran of eight, nine, ten years was, had seen every situation that you could have in a ball game. Oh, uh, bases were loaded. Uh, this is the game... This is the game, the last game of the season. Yeah, last day of the last season. Last game of the Sunday. season when, when we still got a shot. Second game of the doubleheader. All we got to do is win. And uh, we're winning by, by one or two runs at that point in time. And they bring Hank in to pitch to Don Mitcher, I think it is. Yeah. And uh, nobody out. The first thing that Freehand and Mayo say to Hank and Gary is, remember now, this is a guy been in the big leagues eight, nine, ten years. First thing he says to him, Hank, what are you going to do with the ball if the ball's hit back to you? I'm going to home, and the Bill's going to throw it to first base. Hank, say it again. I'm going to home with the ball and home to first. One more time, Hank. Home first. Okay, now you got it, right? You're gonna If your ball's hit to you, you're throwing it home. Boom. Yes, I got it. I got it. Mail gets back to the dugout, just turns around instantaneously the ball's tossed the ball is hit one hop to Hank you know what you know what he does with the ball throws it to first base <laughs> next guy comes up hits a three-run homer that was it yeah pitch ball was made made for a double play one hop boom 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 and it was over with all right but anybody got anything else any questions for these guys no nah, that's enough all right. All right, we're going to be out there tomorrow between uh, what time? 10? 12, 13, 11? 10, 11. What time? 11? Uh, I think. Well, yeah. we'll be out there from like 10, 1030 to uh, 3 tomorrow. So uh, come on out, please, and uh, spend some money for Lee High School. That's what this is all about tomorrow. Nobody's getting paid with this group, are we? No. And uh, I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's, we've been doing this a long time, 14 years now. And we've always had a great time. All, I mean, and 
And there's all kinds of stuff. If, for those of you who are collectors and you haven't been there before, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, it's, uh, this is the kind of show that I like to do because I'm, I'm a pretty big collector. And uh, I, uh, I enjoy just wheeling and dealing with these guys. They love to trade with me. You know, I'll give you two balls for one bat, that, that, that stuff. And uh, we have a lot of fun with it. So if you get out there tomorrow, come say, and make sure you say hello, because we give away free candy. <laughs> Bring a Kit Kat bar. Thanks a lot, guys. Please, Kit Kat bar. <laughs> <laughs>